Welcome to the Ambassadorial Series. I'm Jill Doherty. Probably no Americans have as unique and in-depth perspectives on Russia as United States ambassadors. They arrive at their posts in Moscow often with deep knowledge of the country and its language. They live in Russia. They meet and negotiate with the highest Russian officials. They travel throughout the country, interact with Russian citizens. They not only are eyewitnesses to Russia's history, but actors in that history. In the ambassadorial series, we hear from all the living U.S. ambassadors to modern Russia and to the Soviet Union before it. They recount their personal experiences in Moscow, the people they met, the challenges and even dangers they sometimes faced. And with the benefit of time to ponder these experiences, they tell us how they understand Russia, its relationship with the United States, and the impact that relationship has on the world. I sent my first message uh, that the Soviet Union might break up in July 1990, 18 months before it happened. I didn't predict it then precisely, but I said it was possible. Uh, which I think came as a very great surprise to Washington. For Ambassador Jack Matlock, the very dates he served as ambassador to the Soviet Union are etched in Soviet and Russian history, 1987 to 1991. As history turned out, he was the last U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union. Jack Matlock arrived in Moscow as a seasoned career diplomat, fluent in the Russian language, with scholarly knowledge of Russia's history and culture, who already had traveled widely in the USSR. And it's from that perspective that he observed close up the collapse of the Soviet Union. Ambassador Jack Matlock, thank you very much for talking with us. It's a real honor and, and a personal pleasure because we've seen each other over the years. I think we uh, kind of met or got to know each other way back in the 70s and certainly in the 80s. So I'm eager to hear what you have to say. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. You were the ambassador to the USSR from 1987 to 1991. You were also the ambassador to Czechoslovakia, and you go way back with Russia. And I was thinking of that period from 1981 to 1991, and all of the momentous uh, events of that period, and you saw it from the viewpoint of several different jobs. You were a foreign service officer, then you were the senior White House official dealing with Russia, and then finally as the ambassador. Is there any one particular event that is, was extremely important and made a very big impression upon you? You know, looking back at that period, I think that the most important thing I would take from it is that toward the end of the 1980s, right through the end of 1991, the world went through three almost seismically important geopolitical events. When I say seismically important, they were, I would compare them to the clash of continents uh, to uh, end their geopolitical effect. The first of these was the end of the Cold War, which totally changed the nature of international relations, not just in Europe, but the world over. The second was the fact that the Communist Party lost control of the Soviet Union. Uh, and the third was the Soviet Union itself collapsed. Now, the thing about these three things is that many people, almost no one expected them to happen at, at that particular time. They came almost as a surprise. And looking back, people tend to conflate the three as if it was all one big event. You even have TV shows ending the Cold War when the Soviet Union collapsed. That is incorrect because these three events though they did have interconnections, it had different causes. The end of the Cold War 
occurred because of negotiation between the United States and its allies and the Soviet Union, and it ended on terms that benefited everybody. So if there was a winner, it was everybody. The change of leadership in the Soviet Union, that is the loss of control of the country by the Communist Party, was something that happened uh, internally and led by the leader of the Communist Party, something nobody would have predicted, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. And it was not forced by the West. In fact, if the, if the Cold War had continued, it could not have happened. Then the third, the breakup of the Soviet Union was something that happened against the will of the United States. It was certainly not the victor, uh, a victory in the Cold War, uh, but it was uh, because of internal pressures uh, pushing the country apart. These pressures would not have done so if the Cold War had continued and the arms race, because that acted like the, uh, the, the walls of the pressure cooker keeping the pressure uh, there, uh, keeping the pressure under control. So those three things and the fact that they have been misinterpreted uh, by many people since then, uh, I think uh, are, I would say, the main conclusion I would draw from my experience in those years. Mr. Ambassador, you mentioned with the fall with the fall of the Soviet Union that it was against the will of the United States, if I understood correctly. That is correct. Because if you look at the narrative today, many people say, well, we wanted them to collapse. We forced them to collapse. So you don't agree with that at all. Well, Obviously, there were people that wanted them to collapse. I'm not saying that everybody uh, in our country uh, uh, wanted to preserve the Soviet Union, but certainly President Bush and the Secretary of State Baker, the people at the top, were trying to help Gorbachev, if we could, uh, keep uh, the 12 republics of the Soviet Union, all except the three Baltic countries, and a voluntary federation. And actually, Bush made a speech in Kiev, August 1st, 1991, uh, when he actually recommended uh, that the Ukrainians and implicitly the other non-Russian republics adhere to Gorbachev's uh, 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 federal uh, democratic federal system that he was operating. We would have preferred that. Obviously, our influence had little to do with it, but the point is this was not a victory uh, for the West. Uh, we didn't pursue that, uh, perceive that at the time, and we certainly didn't cause it. Um, um, in fact, uh, the fact that the Cold War was over, the arms race was over, that we were actually pursuing the same ends internationally, uh, and meant that uh, we would have preferred to deal uh, with a country uh, once the three Baltic states were free, which we never recognized they were legally part of the Soviet Union, we would have been very happy to deal with an increasingly democratic uh, association of the 12 republics. Actually, you're making a wonderful point about the end of the Soviet Union. I'm thinking back to that period, and there was grave concern in the United States that Russia would literally collapse, that there would be loose nukes, that you would have civil war and destitution. That was, that was a very difficult period, although there's a certain triumphalism now about it. But at that period, that was pretty frightening. You're absolutely correct that many people have drawn that conclusion and have insisted on treating Russia as if it were a defeated nation uh, and also exaggerating the extent of our power. Well, of course, we are a superpower in, this, in terms of our power to destroy. We can destroy the world if we so choose. I don't know why we would choose to do so. But Nuclear weapons and the power of dis, uh, destruction do not give you the power to change other people's societies, uh, to 
uh, guarantee or help uh, others uh, uh, establish a particular form of government. Uh, and as a matter of fact, even during the Cold War, uh, neither the United States nor the Soviet Union was very successful at that. Uh, so the whole idea that somehow uh, we came out uh, not only stronger than anybody else, we did, uh, but the nature of that strength was uh, grossly exaggerated. You know, I'd like to turn to uh, Mr. Gorbachev because he is such a, uh, I guess, misunderstood in his own country, perhaps, but he's such an important figure in Russian history. And you were in Moscow as the ambassador for most of his time in power. So I wanted to ask you, um, just in terms of your evaluation of him, let's say, as a leader, and then also as a man. He was a true reformer in that he really tried to move his country in a more democratic direction. Now, when he first became um, general secretary, he thought he could do so with the support of the Communist Party. But as he began to introduce reforms, he found that the old party apparatus was opposing him. So he chose, in effect, to take them step by step out of power. And, you know, uh, this was something that nobody would have predicted. And it would say, you, uh, why in the world would the general secretary of the Communist Party try to destroy the party? Well, he didn't actually try to destroy the party, but he did try to take it out of, uh, and successfully over the time, take it out of exclusive power in the country. Uh, and he, uh, that, that, of course, was a very idealistic thing to try to do. Uh, and uh, he obviously was not successful eventually in achieving the ultimate end, which would have been, I would say, a democratizing voluntary um, federation of the Soviet republics. But the fact is that uh, it was not, uh, in a sense, his fault. His, his uh, hostility between him and Yeltsin and then Boris Yeltsin, once he was elected president of the Russian Federation, conspired with the others actually to destroy the Soviet Union. So uh, the irony is that the elected leader of Russia was really the key figure in destroying the Soviet Union, something else that many people don't quite understand. And then as a man, um, you met him obviously many times, you observed him. What kind of a man was he? Is he? He still is, but when you saw him? Well, obviously he, like any other human being, he had a number of um, characteristics. Some of them one could say were contradictory. Uh, I think if we really look at ourselves uh, impassioned, uh, objectively, we'll find we all uh, have certain contradictions. Uh, I think he became a true believer in liberating his country from the totalitarian control of the Communist Party leader. Uh, at the same time, uh, he, I think he also wanted to improve the economy. I think he never really understood a market economy very well. And, uh, the, and he was oftentimes hesitant in taking some of the big steps uh, that were necessary in that area. He did also tend to trust some of the people who were with him at the time, but then broke with him more than he should have. After all, it was his KGB chief whom, who had been his ally earlier and who had been named by Gorbachev, who led the conspiracy against him. And to, to that, Gorbachev seemed to be relatively blind until it happened. But basically, I would say he was an idealist who genuinely believed in and what I would call social democracy uh, of the, you might say, the Scandinavian type. 
uh, and who uh, changed his views on many things under the pressure of events. Uh, and he took uh, enormous uh, chances uh, and you might say was only partially successful. But his real success, I think, was liberating his country from the control of the Communist Party. And by the way, in interviewing him after all of this happened for my books, he has said that that is the proudest thing, that he uh, destroyed the totalitarian system. Well, the fact that the Russians haven't been able to create an ideal democracy since then, uh, that's really up to them because um, outsiders or even Gorbachev can't do it for them. Uh, but uh, I do see him as a liberator. And I think that though most Russians don't at this point see him because what happened after he left was so painful for them, the near anarchy and so on. Uh, I do think that uh, he does not deserve the, the reputation as a, as a failure. And I would hope that in time, uh, Russian historians would also see him more as a liberator. Uh, after all, uh, you might say Moses led his people out of bondage, but he doesn't get blamed because he didn't reach the promised land. Um, and uh, I have much the same attitude toward Gorbachev. You know, as you were talking about him, I was thinking of President Putin, and I know you have observed him as well, um, up close. And I'm just thinking, if Gorbachev seems in your telling, and, and I totally agree with that, as kind of a man of the future who could take himself out of his circumstance and see something to which he aspired. President Putin, um, and I think there are many people who feel this, is still kind of locked into his Soviet era thinking. I mean, there was a period early in Putin's uh, presidency where he did some economic reform and it felt as if he were going to do something differently. But over the past you know, decade or so, we've just seen kind of a stagnation into that old thinking. Is that correct? Do you agree with that? And could you compare the two men? Yes, that would be, I think, a difficult question. I, I think, that to be fair to Putin, I would say he started out being hoping to be an ally of the United States. He was the first to call President Bush after 9-11. He offered full cooperation in our invasion of Afghanistan, including over bright lights, intelligence, and so on. What did we do in exchange? We withdrew from some of our most basic agreements uh, with Russia. We kept expanding NATO, something uh, that uh, the first President Bush had promised Gorbachev we would not do uh, if he had allowed the unification of Germany and Germany to stay in NATO. Step by step, we pulled out of even our most basic agreements. And then increasingly, uh, we uh, are surrounding Russia uh, with uh, right up to their borders, right up to beyond their borders of the former Soviet Union with a military alliance, which they are not in. Now, no leader of Russia, no leader of any other country could maintain a cooperative relationship and also uh, full democracy uh, in their country uh, uh, under uh, the conditions of that sort. Uh, so that uh, the problem in Russia, and it is a, a strong one, was without a certain amount of strong leadership, you get something close to anarchy, which they had in the 90s. And um, Putin pulled them out of that. Uh, they were bankrupt. And now uh, Putin uh, built up a, uh, a sufficient fund of foreign currency that they weathered the, the world recession relatively well. And yet uh, every time, uh, increasingly, uh, their policies uh, uh, differed from ours, uh, we would try to intervene using our power in a way that put them down. And then 
we eventually got into a virtual demonization uh, of him. I would simply remind people, I'm not his uh, advocate. He's done a lot of things that I think are, are damaging to Russia. But after all, the Russian people are entitled to choose their leadership. And there is, though his popularity may not be quite what it used to be, it is still greater in Russia than any of our recent presidents have been in the United States. And I would suggest that before we condemn him too much, we think about that. Well, that's a good point. Um, if I could return just for a moment to the fall of the Soviet Union, because you left, if I'm correct, I think you left the Soviet Union just a few months before that actually happened. And uh, I guess the question for everyone, but especially for you, did you see that coming? Did you have an inkling that anything like that was going to happen? You know, I sent my first message uh, that the Soviet Union might break up in July 1990, 18 months before it happened. I didn't predict it then precisely, but I said it was possible, uh, which I think came as a very great surprise to Washington. And I know uh, later now that these things have been declassified, uh, I was told that uh, uh, President Bush asked for an evaluation uh, from the NSC, and the NSC evaluation said that, well, the embassy uh, had been unnecessarily alarmist. But uh, uh, the, the thing is, what I saw in 1990 was the development in the Russian Republic of a, uh, of a feeling uh, that Russia would be better off independent of the other republics, and they would like to establish something like the EU instead of the Soviet Union. In fact, they would use that. And I said, if the most progressive Russians no longer want to preserve the Union, it's not going to be preserved because it was very clear that predominant opinion in many of the other republics wanted to leave the Soviet Union, wanted to leave the, the system. The, we were watching that. And of course, the, one of the lessons for the United States, I thought, would, would be to speed up our arms reduction negotiations and uh, uh, create as much as we could of, uh, you might say, of a, of a more peaceful world uh, uh, before uh, while Gorbachev could qu still uh, deliver on these major agreements. So if you were unnecessarily alarmist at that period, when it finally happened, did the Bush administration really grapple? Did they understand what was happening? It's because it was very chaotic at the time. Well, you know, they certainly understood that Gorbachev was under a lot of pressure and there was fear that he would be removed. I think there was the assumption that if there was a coup against him, it would succeed. Um, now, <laughs> actually, my own opinion was, and I, I was already had left Moscow, had retired from the Foreign Service when the attempted coup occurred. But I said on television that first day uh, that uh, I thought it would not succeed uh, because I knew everybody involved. And I said, these people are not prepared for a civil war. And uh, therefore, uh, I don't think this is going to be successful. Of course, uh, two days later, it was clear that it was not successful. But it was successful, and so reducing Gorbachev's authority and that of the Soviet Union, that it allowed Yeltsin and the leaders of Belarus and Ukraine uh, to meet and, in effect, uh, simply uh, dissolve the Soviet Union. Another thing that I think we did understand, uh, because I had been given a warning uh, that there was a conspiracy developing against Gorbachev, uh, I was given the warning to convey it to uh, Yeltsin, who was then in Washington. And, uh, and then I was asked uh, to warn Gorbachev. And I tried to do so without naming the people involved. 
Uh, he didn't take it seriously, but it turned out that the people we had identified a month before the coup were in fact the leaders of the coup. Um, an irony there, however, is that uh, when we made that report, uh, uh, the, uh, President Bush talked to Gorbachev on a telephone line uh, that was maintained by the KGB and uh, actually named my source, uh, who was the mayor of Moscow. Uh, and uh, later, the mayor of Moscow told me that uh, he thought that that leak was one of the reasons the Fuku failed, because Kuchkov, the head of the KGB, who was organizing it, um, uh, suddenly realized he had a leak and he had to stop planning. And of course, the fact that it was so poorly planned, many of the people who were expected to do certain things like uh, arrest Yeltsin simply refused to do it uh, when the coup came. So uh, you know, later the mayor of Moscow told me, maybe it's a good thing the leak occurred uh, because it, it may have been the flaw that uh, prevented the coup from taking place. So basically I would say, you know, we, basically we did understand what was going on. Uh, I think if there was any difference, it was that the assumption, I believe, on most of the Bush administration, and it would not be an unreasonable assumption, was that if there was a coup, it would succeed and replacing uh, Gorbachev and many of the reforms would stop. My own feeling was that uh, at that point, it was unlikely to succeed because the country had changed to the point that they would re rise up and that people like the coup plotters were not prepared to maintain a civil war. They were not the sort of people that the Bolsheviks were uh, when Lenin and Stalin and uh, their associates took control of Russia. Ambassador Matlock, let me ask you a question that um, troubles me sometimes because you know, we, right now, relations with Russia are very bad. There's no question. But it does raise the issue of, can we ever have normal relations with Russia? There's always something different. It is not, it's not Belgium. <laughs> you know, it is a very different country. And I think some people would would hope someday that the United States and Russia could simply have a relationship as two regular countries and not freighted with all of this history and sometimes animosity. But what do you say to that? Is there, is there a way that we can have stable, normal relations? I, absolutely. I think that many of the problems uh, today are not only exaggerated, but quite distorted, basically. U.S. interests and Russian interests are much more convergent than they are different. I mean, if we look at the real dangers facing us, first of all, we've got this pandemic. This is something we're all in together. This is not, uh, we're either going to solve it as human beings or, or we're, you know, we're going to have the problem. And, and probably the COVID-19 problem is not the last of these. So, uh, this is something that clearly it's in our interest to cooperate because in, until you control it everywhere, it's not control. Uh, second, of course, nuclear weapons. If they are ever used, even partially of the ones now, it is difficult to see how mankind is going to survive. Uh, it is certainly in our mutual interest to make sure they are not used. Uh, and uh, then uh, global warming, climate change, these are problems that obviously affect us all. And these are much bigger problems than where you draw the line between uh, Russia and Ukraine. I mean, that has never had any relevance uh, to American security and it shouldn't today. Uh, and I think if we uh, understand that we do not have a formula that fits everybody, we say we must spread democracy, well, I like democracy too. I think we should have it. But I know that democ people can only create democracy for themselves. Outsiders can't do it. 
And one thing, you don't understand another society uh, enough. Uh, and But the whole idea that, uh, that if we don't like uh, something Russia does, we have to sanction them or we have to uh, make them pay a price for something they're doing, which they consider important in their national interest, that is not going to work. It's not going to work with Russia. It's not going to work with China or anywhere else in the world. And what worries me today is that we seem to be reverting to the sort of competition as to who is going to control what part of the world that brought us to world wars in the 20th century. We know how they ended. We should understand that if we get into that frame of, of, of uh, thought, uh, all of us are going to lose. Uh, the point is that if we solve the big problems, I've named some of them, others are the collapse of states, the migration of people, which is going to continue because of global warming and other environmental changes, uh, failed states, all of these things are problems for all of us. And uh, uh, to, to start trying to, uh, uh, in effect, dictate what kind of government other people have. I think is a losing strategy. Uh, and I, I do think, uh, although I don't by any means approve of everything Russia has done, uh, uh, however, I do find that current hostility is in reaction to what they consider an American policy of treating them as losers, of humiliating them, of in effect demonizing their leaders uh, and doing this uh, talking about corruption, uh, which of course is there, while at the same time ignoring our own. And, you know, we've only seen from the latest election how divided we are and how fragile our own democracy is. So, I, you know, uh, I really think we have to be a, a, a little more, uh, I would say, objective about our own behavior uh, and uh, and certainly in, uh, I believe, our own interest, uh, we need to cooperate, not just with Russia, but also to have uh, a cooperative relationship with China. Uh, it will have competitive aspects, as any relationship will, uh, but these should be kept peaceful. And uh, we, uh, we should begin uh, to diminish our uh, our attempt, in effect, to police the world or to transform it into the image uh, we inaccurately have of ourselves. I have just a couple of more questions. And uh, is, do you have advice for future ambassadors to Russia? You know, I have to say that an ambassador can do very little to improve a relationship unless the policy of his country allows him to, him or her. Uh, the fact is, uh, ambassadors represent their governments, their presidents, their secretaries of state. Uh, they cannot, of course, they can advise. And I was very lucky that I had a president and a secretary of state that consulted me, listened to me. Uh, we had a wonderful relationship. But if, you know, if the policies of your country are one that is trying to dominate or uh, deny the country things that they feel are important to them, there's not much an ambassador can do uh, to improve that. Given the fact that if the ambassador is lucky enough to have a president uh, uh, and secretary of state who are, I would say, supporting uh, good relations or resolution of problems with the country, obviously the ambassador can do a lot. Uh, and it helps a great deal, uh, though it is not an absolute prerequisite, if you know the language of the culture of the country, if you understand its history, uh, the, you might say the psychology of many of the people, if you have at least the personal skills that you can become personal friends of the leaders, uh, that they will confide in you. And that also, but requires uh, discretion. Um, you know, there were some things that I would be told by Soviet leaders that I wouldn't put in a telegram because I knew it might leak. 
about I would do a handwritten letter to the Secretary of State and ask him to share it only with the President and the National Security Advisor. So uh, I would say there are a lot of things, but an ambassador is able to, I think, much better able to interpret for his own government what is going into another country if the ambassador uh, knows the people there, if you know them in sufficient depth that you can socialize with them and deal with them in their own language, you learn a lot more. So uh, I, I would say that uh, preparation you know, for uh, successful diplomacy certainly means that you need to develop the, uh, the skills that a diplomat, any diplomat needs anywhere. But if you add to that some in-depth knowledge of uh, the country uh, where you are accredited, and if you're able to go back there enough that you make actual friends, uh, then I think uh, that, uh, that will certainly enhance the policy of any, uh, of any uh, government. Okay, and that leads me to the very last question. You've been very generous with your time, but it's a perfect introduction to what I wanted to ask, which is if anybody knows Russia, and if anybody has a long history of being deeply interested in that country, it is you because you started in college, if not before, perhaps even before, but I know you studied Russia, you've taught the Russian language, um, you've it, throughout your career, you have really looked at that country very deeply, and I'm sure that you have very strong feelings about it. So asking you to pull that together with your many years of experience, is there some, um, some concept or idea or understanding of Russia that you have that could help us try to understand Russia in these difficult times? Is there a truth of Russia that you understand? Well, I think you have to, first of all, know something about their culture and their historical experience. And, uh, and you have to have at least enough empathy to understand how they look at things. After all, this is a country that has been repeatedly invaded and occupied by outsiders. Uh, we haven't been, you know. Uh, we've been in wars, but uh, not, the, not even the War of 1812 where we were really occupied uh, by the British. So we have never experienced sort of a neighbor invading us and occupying our territory for an extended period of time. That undoubtedly leads to a different psychology toward a number of things. Uh, and uh, I'm naming just one of, of many uh, characteristics. But also, I would say, you know, Russia, like every other country, is full of contradictions. You know, uh, uh, George uh, uh, Kennan uh, once said uh, that anytime you're confronted with two contradictory statements about Russia, the safest assumption is that both are true. And, uh, but, you know, uh, you can sort of laugh at that, but if you think about it, doesn't the same apply to us, if we're really being objective? So uh, the, the fact is that uh, I think the basic thing in dealing with Russians or anybody else is not to forget that we're all human beings. And Nations interacting with each other are not like billiard balls clashing, but they are human beings interacting. And, you know, common sense skills in dealing with human beings or the application of the classical golden rule uh, uh, offer sometimes the best advice, uh, I think, uh, for a successful diplomacy. Well, Ambassador Jack Matlock, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity.